Even when the winds are calm, it doesn't take much to start floating away. From the people you love, from the important things, from God. Maybe you don't even decide to move. The current decides for you. A slight shift in the breeze is all it takes. You hardly notice a change at first. You round a bend, ease over the rocks, let gravity take over. Suddenly you realize you're way off course, changing directions again and again. You don't recognize your surroundings anymore. You're tossed around, dodging obstacles, falling. Then, when you finally get a chance to catch your breath and look around, you think, how did I end up here? And how do I get back? Well, hey everyone, welcome to Eagleburg Church. Welcome to those of you joining us online. My name is John. If we haven't met before, it's really good to be here with you. We are in the fifth and final week of a series called Drift. And what we've seen over the last couple years is that it's been easy for people to drift. Our, our friends, our neighbors, even ourselves. And when people drift, it's often subtle and incremental. Barely distinguishable on a daily basis, but those small increments over time can lead to huge gaps. And before we realize that subtle drift has led us to a place we, we never expected, and maybe even a place where we're ready to give up. And over the course of this series, we've talked about drifting spiritually, relationally, culturally, personally. And today I want to talk to us about how what happens when we drift missionally, which in its most basic de definition is a goal or ambition. This spring, I went on a mission to accomplish a triathlon. Now, I've got a list of like 10 things I want to do before I turn 40, which is in a couple of years. And at the top of the list was a triathlon, which involves biking, running, and swimming. When I signed up, I thought, well, how hard can this be? I mean, I've done some running, right? I can pedal a bike. I mean, swimming, I can stay afloat. Now, never mind that an orthopedic surgeon recently took some scans of my knees, said something about early onset arthritis and suggested maybe I hang up the running shoes. Never mind I don't own the right kind of bike or that the helmet I have is, is way too small for my extremely large head. <laughs> never mind that I've never worn a wetsuit or swam long distances in an open waters before. I was determined to accomplish this mission. And so I found a 12-week training plan on the internet and got to work biking, swimming, running four to five days a week. Well, when the day of the race came, I was standing there at Ramsey County Beach, and I looked out at the buoys that they set up to mark the swim distance in White Bear Lake, and I thought, oh, no. <laughs> what have I done? Because up until this point, my training uh, for swimming, I just swam laps in a pool 25 yards back and forth where whenever I got tired, I could just catch my breath on the ledge. But there were no ledges out in White Bear Lake to catch my breath, all right? So the race started, we sprinted into the waters, and, and I soon realized I was literally in over my head. I went from a confident freestyle to a breaststroke to a side stroke to what I'd call a floating stroke. Just, just <laughs> let the wetsuit just keep you buoyant and drift with the other swimmers. Every time I looked up, having made little to no progress, I had these thoughts, why am I doing this again? What exactly was the point? Should I just quit and hop in that nice little boat that's next to me and just let them, you know, carry me in? Well, somehow, some way, second to last, not dead last, second to last in the swimming portion, I just limped and drifted into shore. Now, thankfully, I had enough energy to hop on the bike, which wasn't too difficult. Then on the last leg, the run, right at the end, I put this five foot tall, 68-year-old woman in my crosshairs and sprinted right past her <laughs> for 48th place out of 60, which I felt great about. But <laughs> Here's what I wonder. How often do we start something? We start out to accomplish something. We get excited about something, and then somewhere along the way, we, we want to give up. Or we ask, does this even matter? Uh, why did I start this? in the first place? <laughs> All questions I asked myself while completing this triathlon. And what we found over the last couple of years is that people are asking similar questions 
about the mission of the church. They're asking questions like, wait a second, what's the point? Do I personally care about the mission? What, what if I just quit? And I wonder, have you ever asked yourself those questions? And maybe some of you are like, actually, I haven't. That's good. But others, for whatever reason, have lost passion for the mission God has given every follower of Christ. They started out passionate, but they've kind of drifted away from it. What's that mission? Jesus says this in Matthew 28. He says, therefore, go and make disciples. That's the mission. Jesus is giving his followers. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This is the great co-mission. We partner with Jesus to accomplish this mission in the world. See, our primary assignment as Christians is to reach people for Christ. People who are broken, hurting and lost. People who are complacent. Maybe they're spiritually drifting. People who are destined to an eternity spent without God. Now, one can argue all they want that you can accomplish this mission without the church. I've, I've read those blogs. I've heard those arguments. And, and in, in theory, it's, it's partially true, partially. But in reality, according to God's word, the church is God's plan A to accomplish this mission in the world. So at Eagle Brook, we've defined this mission as this. We are empowered by God to reach Others go and make disciples for Christ. This is our mission as a church. And, and maybe you've been around long enough to have heard us talk about this before, and you've seen us, you know, put this up on walls and in different sayings or things that we hand out. And maybe there's a part of you that's like, you know, I've been around other businesses and, and organizations and nonprofits and churches to know it's just a matter of time before this mission statement changes, right? I mean, they, they always change. I'm here to tell you this mission for our church is not going to change. It hasn't changed in the last 20 years, and it won't change in the future. And again, here's why. It's our belief that this is the primary mission of every follower of Christ. But you know as well as I do that, unfortunately, some people end up drifting away from that. They end up losing passion for it, and they end up leaving faith. Now, how does that happen? Why do people start out excited about something, but then end up quitting? Well, there's lots of reasons, oftentimes real legitimate ones. Maybe they've been burned by someone or hurt by something within the church. But more often than not, here's what we find. People drift because they lose passion for the mission that God has given them to reach others for Christ. And that's why the author of Hebrews says it this way. It's been kind of our theme verse throughout this series. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not what? So that we don't drift away. We have to pay the most careful attention attention because every one of us, including myself, is in danger of drifting. Like you, our, our weekends and weekday nights become busier and busier as our kids get older. We spent some time this week filling out our calendar for September, and it's, it's jam-packed already. It's not easy to prioritize this primary mission that God has given us. So even we as a pastor's family must pay careful attention. By the way, I don't believe any one of us actually intend to drift. It's not like people start out by putting their faith in Christ, getting active in the church, becoming passionate about reaching others, spreading this message. They don't start out that way, all with the intention of eventually quitting. No. I mean, that's why you're here. You're not here so that one day you can eventually drift and quit. Parents don't want their kids to drift away either. At their core, people need the church to be a place of hope and healing, grace and truth. And they need the church to remind them of their primary mission. If you haven't heard us say this before, I, I, I need to say it because it's, it's, it's got to be crystal clear before I share the other things I'm going to talk about. We're an imperfect church. We just are. We, we make mistakes. Trust me, we're just not that good or not that smart. I'm telling you. 
But I'll tell you what, we do our very best to stay laser focused on this mission and reflect the heart of God. Because we know these same people have people in their lives that they want and know to experience the same things they have. The last week we heard from a father who said, my 17 year old son said that was the best message he'd ever heard. It was a couple weeks ago on Cultural Drift by Jason. If you haven't watched that, go check it out. But the father went on to say, I'm so glad we have this church to know we're not alone in trying to raise our son well. He wants his kids to experience the same. Just last week, I met a guy named Brandon who said, I started watching online during the pandemic. And he told me I was so moved by the music and the message just watching online that I brought my wife and two daughters who are seven and four years old to the Woodbury campus when it reopened. And then he said, I can't even begin to tell you how transforming this place has been for our family to know we have a community of faith to raise our daughters. And he told me a couple times, let me just say it's been life changing. You know, I love the church because of stories like these. These are real people with real stories whose lives and eternities have been greatly impacted. And they so badly want other people, the people they know and love to experience the same. I also love the church because Jesus loves the church. In Matthew 16, Jesus says to Peter, he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. You know, the church has been around for 2000 plus years and thus far, nothing has prevailed against the church. Not crucifying Jesus, not killing 11 of the 12 disciples, not theological division, not the Crusades, the Dark Ages, not denominational splits, another fallen church leader, world wars, plagues, or COVID-19. The gates of hell don't stand a chance. Jesus promised that the church will prevail, but we must do our part, and that is to stay on mission and keep swimming even when we don't feel like it. So there are two things every Christ follower must do in order to prevent mission drift. And the first is, well, we got to grow our heart for lost people. Uh, what do we do when something's lost? Typically, we look for it, right? Uh, unless you're me, and maybe I'm not the only one, but I do three things before I actually look for something that's lost. The first is, I blame my kids. Marley probably took my keys and threw them in the garbage on purpose just to get back at me for taking away her iPad. And the second thing, I told you, there's three. The second thing I do is that I'll do whatever it takes to get a hold of my wife somehow. I might spend minutes, hours trying to text, call. Emily probably knows where it is. And so, Emily, have you seen my sunglasses? I mean, I don't blame you, Emily, but can you just help me look for them? And then the third thing I do, I told you there's three. The third thing that I do before even looking for this lost item is that I blame Emily in my heart. Okay, not out loud, but in my heart, I'm just, you know, convinced that she probably moved it or whatever, but now she's so lovingly patient with me. She'll eventually come help me look for this lost item. All the while, I know she's thinking, did you even look for it without asking for my help? And then, of course, eventually we find the lost item in the exact same spot I left it. Uh, I saw one guy write on Twitter, major accomplishment today. I found something on my own without asking my wife for help. I deserve a medal. We have a <laughs> low bar, okay? If we just, you know. <laughs> In Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells just a couple stories about how God responds when someone or something is lost. The story is about a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. And he's trying to describe the heart of God. In each one of these stories, something is, is lost that really matters to someone else. The lost sheep to the shepherd, the lost coin to the woman, the lost son to the dad. And this is where we pick it up. Jesus says, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and then go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he calls his friends and neighbors and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. 
I tell you in the same way, there is more rejoicing in heaven over one lost sinner who returns to God than over 99 righteous persons who haven't strayed away. Jesus says, all heaven rejoices when one lost person finds their way to God. That one lost person matters more to God than anything else, even the 99 who haven't strayed. And so let me ask, how do you respond when, when someone is lost? Uh, when my son Maddox was six years old, his Aunt Sarah took him to a St. Paul Saints game. And because he was old enough to go into the bathroom by himself, she let him. But little did she know that Maddox came out a different exit door than she expected. And so for about 10, 15 minutes, Sarah thought Maddox was lost. And so she went into the men's bathroom to look for him. She started asking around, frantically searching. She started crying, wondering what she was going to tell us, his parents. Then over the PA, she heard, Sarah McNamara, please report to Gate 100. We have something you've lost. And so she sprinted over to gate 100 with tears just streaming down her face, sees Maddox and gives him a hug just over and over again as he leans into her arms as they embrace one another. A question, why, why would Sarah search so passionately for something she lost? Well, because she loves him that much. Is it possible that God loves people so much that he is frantically searching for people who are lost. Now, maybe we'll never lose a child at a St. Paul Saints game, but all of us are in danger of losing someone we know for all eternity. All of us have friends, coworkers, family members who are lost. They might be lost in their marriage or family. They might be lost in their addiction or, or lack of peace or just lost in life but they're also in danger of being lost for all eternity unless God uses us to help them find their way. My favorite story that Jesus tells is the story of the lost son who returns back to his father and wonders if he'll be forgiven. See, the story goes, the son took his inheritance early. He squandered all of it with wild, sinful living and ends up feeding pigs for a job. And as he's sitting among the pigs, he has this thought, I wonder if I go back to my father and beg for his mercy, that he'll let me work for him, become one of the hired workers, because there is no way, I've screwed up too much, there's no way he's going to take me back as his son. How many people feel so lost and so broken that there's just no way that God would forgive or accept them. And maybe today you feel that way. But I want you to see the rest of the story and, and to look at God's heart when the son returns to the father because this is the kind of love that God has for all people. It says this, but while the boy was a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion, not shame, or condemnation, but compassion for his son, for him. For he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The father ran to his son. God runs to all lost people who return back to him. The story concludes, let's have a feast, the father says, for this son of mine was dead, and he's alive again. He was lost, but now he's found, and he throws a party because nothing in all the world matters more to God than a lost son or daughter who finds their way back to him, back to the Father. That's the heartbeat and mission of this church. It's why we do what we do. We want to be a church where every single person knows they are loved by us and loved by God. We want to reflect the heartbeat of God, the heartbeat that God has for all lost people. One of the best ways to prevent mission drift is to grow our heart for lost people, which leads to the second and final thing to do to prevent missions drift. It's, well, to get in the game. 
you know, more often than not, the people who end up drifting are the people who have remained spectators for too long without actually getting in the game. Now, please hear me say, and this is so important to us as, as a church, that if you are someone who's checking things out or you've been coming for a little bit and trying to figure out your place or what all this faith stuff is all about, we actually want you to remain spectators as long as you need, truly. But if we remain fans for too long, well, you know there's a big difference between watching the game and actually playing in the game. One of the highlights of the NFL season for me is watching my mother-in-law watch the Vikings on TV. (laughs) Now, let me just start off by saying, before I say anything else unrelated to what I'm about to say, I have truly the greatest mother-in-law in the world. She's an incredible Nona to our grandkids, and so if you're watching, please just know that I love you. But typically, what she does while sitting in her full Viking getup is that she loves to yell at the players on the TV like they can hear. What's he thinking? How come they pay him at all? I mean, isn't time that we find a kicker who can actually kick a field goal? And what's happening? Now, sometimes we have to warn our kids that they might learn new words from their Nona while watching the Vikings game. So just talk to us if they've heard something they don't know. She's pretty good at holding it in. But it's worth noting, uh, my mother-in-law's never kicked a field goal. She's never run a football at a 300-pound lineman. She's never thrown a 50-yard touchdown pass. I'm not even sure she can call the right plays in Madden. Now, she certainly feels like she has all the right answers sitting in the chair, but my guess is she'd feel quite differently if we put some shoulder pads on her and had her line up against the Green Bay Packers. Here's the comparison. Thank you, Packers fan. There's a big difference between watching and playing the game. Your perspective changes when you get involved. When you get involved in church, it changes the way you feel about the mission. When people serve, they're more focused now on how they can help others. When people give, they're now more concerned with how effective the overall church is at accomplishing their mission to reach others for Christ. When when you invite When people invite, I'm telling you, it changes everything. It's not about what you're going to experience. It's all about what that other person is going to experience. Christine Kane, in her great book, How Did I Get Here, says this, church is not just about what we can get out of it. Now, when I attend church, when I come to church, I want God to speak to me. I need God to fill me. So it is about what we can get out of it. That's part of it, but it's not just about that but it's also about what we can give while we're there. The Greek word for church in the New Testament is ekklesia. And ekklesia is a gathering or assembly of people, people who are called out by God to be used for his purposes. And while Jesus is the head and leader of this church and should be for every church, the church then is made up of people like us. It's not just me. Speaking up here, it's not just Jason or Ryan. It's not just the worship leaders or the campus pastors, not even just the kids ministry volunteers. No, no, the church is is all of us gathered together. It's that person up there. It's you over there. It's the person in Ham Lake, Rochester, person joining us in, in Wyzetta or White Bear Lake, the person joining us online, we collectively are the church. Paul says it this way in Romans 12. He says, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not have all the same function, so in Christ we, though many of us, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We collectively are the church. And the question is, if we're going to fulfill our God-given mission, if we're going to be effective as one body working together to accomplish this mission, the question is, are we in the game? Do we show up most weeks ready to contribute? Do we serve? Do we love? Do we invite? Do we we give? Do we 
Are we on mission personally? Paul says it a slightly different way here. He says it in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us, all of us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. That's the ball game right there. We so badly want people to come back to God. That's our mission to share with the whole world. So we have to ask ourselves, what would we be willing to do to reach others for Christ if we knew it would change their life and their eternity? I want to share a couple stories with you of people who've been impacted. This January, a young woman named Cassie lost her husband unexpectedly. And during that time, a family who attends every four o'clock service on Saturday, right here at the Lina Lakes campus, sits right down front, invited her to attend during our soul repair series. And so she came for that entire series and God began to repair the broken parts of her soul when she was at her lowest. Today, she said she would not be where she's at without that initial invitation. Pete's an executive business leader, and you know he, he'd heard of Eagle Brook Church before, but always just assumed it was a cult. And so several people invited him, and he was a little skeptical. I mean, what's this place people talk about? And so he secretly checked out things online. As he started watching the services and engaging with the messages, he realized uh, that we weren't a cult, thank, thank goodness. And uh, he brought his family to the Ham Lake campus when it opened. And now he can't help but tell anyone and everyone to come experience the same thing. Emily, my wife, invited her sister about 10 years ago. Uh, at the time, her sister was pretty opposed to church and God and just wasn't really interested. And so somewhat jokingly, Emily offered to pay her $20 if she'd come with her once. Uh, think we're above bribery? <sighs> we're not. I mean, we'll do whatever it takes. <laughs> I'm not sure if, if they ever exchanged money, but, but uh, her sister took her up on that offer and since then has a profound relationship with Jesus. Just an incredible faith, an incredible person. We got stopped a couple months ago by a friend we hadn't seen in several years. And the person she was with said, John and Emily, I, I got to tell you my story. Right before the pandemic, I traveled to Prague and then things like shut down. I got stuck in Prague. And so while there, I invited a friend to watch Eagle Brook Church online with me. And this friend who was born and raised in Prague had literally never heard of Jesus before. And she said, now every week, she and this friend attend Eagle Brook Church online together. One of our staff members invited her two nephews who are twin high school seniors to the Rev event just a couple weeks ago. The Rev event, for those who don't know, was a day-long gathering for high school students held at our Lionel Lakes campus, but for everyone in our church. Well, those boys, including most of their family, really, again, had not been interested in church, had never been to Eagle Brook before, didn't really have an active faith. But she told those twin boys that she would pay their way if they just came and, of course, promised all kinds of free food and fun, you know, to kind of entice them to come. Well, at the event, at the end of the night, against all odds, but through the power of the church, one of those boys made a first-time decision to follow Christ. And Heather, the staff member in, who invited her nephew, said, God used the symphony, I love that, the symphony of the church to reach my nephew. Last story, I promise. A young woman recently lost her father, again, quite unexpectedly. Well, when the police went to her house, uh, they called one of our Lakeville pastors, who's also a chaplain with the police department, to come and meet the family and talk with them while they removed the body from the home. Well, after our pastor left, everyone had cleared out. The police officer who arrived on the scene first, stuck around and said to this young woman, you should really come to Eagle Brook Church and start attending there. And so she decided to and came for those next three weeks, each week coming forward for prayer. 
And God got through to her the next week because on the fourth week, on July 3rd and 4th, she came forward for prayer and put her faith in Christ for the very first time. Again, let me ask you, how far would you be willing to go to reach people if you knew it would impact their life and eternity? And I know that so many of us have invited people before and they've said no or, or they came once and didn't come back again and we're tempted to give up. But God's not giving up on them. So let's not give up either. Let's not stop trying or praying or loving those people. Or maybe you're someone who's never invited before. Maybe this is your opportunity to get in the game. I'm telling you, one of the best ways to prevent mission drift is to invite someone. It changes the way we feel about the mission and it aligns our heart with the Father's heart. And God's heart is that he'll stop at nothing to reach those people, to reach people who are far from him. And he wants to use you and me working together as the church to accomplish this mission. I'm gonna invite the band to play one final song for us. I'm gonna ask that you just Remain seated and take in the lyrics and the song because this song is all about how far God will go to reach the one. And at one point, you might have been that person who was lost, a person who was far from him, and somehow, some way, God got through to you and quite possibly through another person. So as you reflect on this song, take some time to think about, to reflect on the lengths that God will go to reach people and pray for those people in your lives who are lost. Let's do that now.
pretty incredible to think just how far God will go. He'll stop at nothing to reach people who are far from him, nothing. And he wants to use us, the church, to go and accomplish this mission. How far would we go to reach people if we knew it would change their lives and eternities? Hey, across all campuses, let's stand for closing prayer. As we think about this message, I'm just thinking about how grateful I am to be a part of this church. There's so many people who are devoted followers of Christ, people who are on mission every single week, and that's just really a humbling thing. But I know there's also people who've, who've never taken that opportunity to invite someone, to share with someone. It feels scary, intimidating, maybe just get lost in the mix. It happens to me, trust me, all the time. But as a church, let's commit to this challenge. Let's just see what God would do if we extend that invitation. Because again, God will stop at nothing to reach those people. And he wants to use us. So let's go be that for God. Let's pray, everyone. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for this church. Thank you for this place. Imperfect. Make our mistakes. But God, we want to be focused on this mission. We want people to hear the message that they can come back to their father, their heavenly father. No matter how far they feel, no matter how broken they feel, no matter what they've done, God, that there is, we want them to hear there is a loving father that is waiting for them to just come back, to return to him, to receive the forgiveness 
and love and mercy and grace they didn't even know was possible. That's the message we want to share. And so God, give us opportunities throughout the week to just extend that invitation, to remind people, to to tell people, hey, why don't you come with me to church next week? Why don't you come with and just see what it's all about? Why don't you join me online? God, give us the courage. Give us opportunities. Give me opportunities to do that this week, God. Also that, also that they hear about this loving Father who will stop at nothing, who will stop at nothing to get them to come back to Him. And that changes everything. That's the ball game, God. That's what we want to be about as a church. God, and we're just grateful that you have restored us, redeemed us, forgiven us. And I do pray for those people who don't feel that. I'm just reminded of there are people who aren't ready to go reach people because they feel unreachable themselves. I pray that you would remind them right now that they are loved. They have a heavenly father who is waiting for them. And that he will run to them wherever they're at, no matter how broken they feel. Pray that they would experience that love and forgiveness right now, here in this moment. God, thank you for loving us just as we are. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks for coming, everyone. We'll see you next week as we kick off a brand new series.